Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. With nearly 40 million adults providing care for a family member or loved one, the need for caregiver resources are at an all-time high. The, our next guest says the release of this book could not be more perfect since the bipartisan legislation raised recognize, assist, include, support, and engage Family Caregivers Act has been signed into law. When she wrote the study, it was on her heart to provide the church a tool to raise families just like her own. This resource can bring caregivers together and uh, bring them together and help them walk a tough path by providing encouragement and solace through God's Word. Since our inception in 2017, our ministry, Igniting a Nation, through this program, Revealing the Truth, has devoted a minimum of one program every month to address the growing number and needs of caregivers. We are devoted to equipping the church to be a part of the solution and a respite for the weary heart of many caregivers. Iron Stream Media is proud to announce the premier title in its Ascender book line, The Heart of the Caregiver, From Overwhelmed to Overjoyed. Author and caregiver Mary Tuttero wrote this biblically-based study out of a deep desire to meet the spiritual needs of the caregiver. She saw a need in the marketplace for a resource that brings encouragement, healing, and hope to the spiritual lives of the growing number of caregivers worldwide. A transformational study, The Heart of the Caregiver, urges the reader to seek God's life-changing love through scriptures each day, allowing the Holy Spirit to compel the caregiver to live out God's call to love others through service to them. Mary and her husband, Wynn, have two adult children and live in Charleston, South Carolina. Their daughter, Mary Addison, has cognitive and physical challenges and an active seizure disorder. They also cared for Wynn's mother through cancer and dementia. A former anchorwoman and marketing executive, Mary now writes, speaks, and leads online and in-person small groups for caregivers. Here to talk about her study, The Heart of the Caregiver, from overwhelmed to overjoyed is Mary Tuttero. Mary, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Great to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. As you know, we uh, uh, are very devoted to the cause uh, and plight uh, of the caregiver as we have the caregiver's hour uh, each month on the uh, last Monday of uh, every month uh, with Peter Rosenberger. Uh, who you know uh, yep. as well, who has uh, been taking care of Gracie for over 30 years and uh, almost 100 operations, over $10 million worth of uh. bills, double, amp double amputee. And uh, we have become a, a, a voice, a clarion call for people to face this uh, continuing and ongoing and ever-increasing need uh, as we as a generation age, uh, uh, so, our, so do our parents age and our children are facing challenges in this new world with uh, all kinds of reactions to medications, uh, sporting events, uh, car accidents, just there's just so many different issues that arise both genetically and uh, circumstantially. But I want to go back to kind of uh, get to know who uh, Mary Totoro is and go back to your childhood and uh, take a look at, at uh, your journey to faith, kind of what influenced you and, and as a little girl, what your vision of what life was going to be like, how you mapped it out, how you planned it out, and <clears throat> how you uh, were surprised uh, wow. by the by the by the change of events wow how much time do we have oh, well i'm going to give you wow. i'm going to give you 19 minutes to answer this question <laughs> well actually i was raised in a home where we were church goers uh but i have to be honest until my daughter came along uh 27 years ago i wasn't a believer i had never taken god up on his word church was a club that we were members of uh Went faithfully every Sunday, sang in the choir, you know, got confirmed, took communion, the whole deal. But I had never realized the power of a living God in my life at all. Um, I, I did the thing that most people do, and that is I built a life based on what I'd been told 
you needed to build a life on to have a, a life of value and purpose, a life that would count. Uh, went to a private high school, went to a big state university, uh, became an anchor woman right out of college, uh, then ended up running my own international public relations f firm uh, and was, so to speak, living the dream. <laughs> you know, big house, big cars, big plans. Uh, my husband was uh, running a big division for an insurance company. He lived traveling around in a little plane the size of a Volvo, and I lived... Um, working 80 hours a week uh, in a in my company and I when we found ourselves pregnant we hired a nanny and swore that this baby wouldn't allow us to miss a beat and boy did God have other plans <laughs> so that's where it came to the crescendo of um, was God real or not for me so here you, you're given this gift of Mary Addison, this incredibly special child, this uh, every hope and dream for her to follow in your footsteps. Does she want to become an anchor woman? Does she want to uh, be, like, be like mom? Will she take after dad? Uh, who's she going to be? What the dream and vision was? And, uh, you found out that uh, uh, she had some challenges that were going to face her. Did you find this out prior to her birth? Uh, were there any signs, any indications that there was something going on that uh, uh, was, was not uh, according to... My daughter is 33 weeks pregnant, so I actually have the app and I know uh, every week, on every Friday, it tells me uh, the progress of my granddaughter, the size she is, the length she is. And my daughter just spent the last Father's Day through today with me. She lives in Florida and came up to spend the week with me because uh, this will be the last week she'll be able to travel before she has the baby. So, you know, we, we, we follow the test. I have a copy of all the sonograms and all the reports and all of that. So when did you have a first indication that there might be something going on? Well, this was 27 years ago, but Mama knows, and I could feel her having seizures inside of me, but they never could catch it on a sonogram. So, I mean, I knew there was something going on, but I had no idea what it was. And then actually, you know, when my son was born, they knew they had done all the villa sampling and everything, and they told us that he had Down syndrome and that we needed to abort him. And, you know, thank God we didn't because it, uh, we prayed and everything was perfectly fine with him. But that's a whole nother story. Uh, but with Mary Addison, uh, when she was born, literally the ground started shaking underneath our feet uh, that day. Because everything, she went into a big, long seizure right after she was born. And it became clear that we were going to have a child with profound challenges and everything that I'd been taught about what, uh, what would make a relevant human being with a purposeful life, uh, did not seem like according to the doctors that it would ever be possible for my daughter that, you know, she would probably not even live to see the end of her first year. Um, and that if she lived, she'd be profoundly challenged. She'd be mentally and physically challenged. And, um, you know, I began putting pieces together, zooming through all the plans, just like parents do going, oh, and I want my child to go here. Well, she would never go to college. She would never marry. She would never have children and give me grandchildren. She would never. And I began to realize how much of my life I had put on having this child, uh, before she was even born, how much I needed her to fulfill for me. But it turns out we'd been given a tremendous gift of a child who um, I love to say it's like the scene in um, It's a Wonderful Life where God calls Clarence the little angel and says, see that man down there who's about to commit suicide? Well, I think God probably did that to Mary Addison and said, you see those incredibly materialistic, self-centered, arrogant yuppies? I want you to go down there and teach them about who I am. <laughs> And oh, by the way, I want you to do it in a mentally and physically challenged body. Mm. And uh, 
boy, has she. And caring for her absolutely shattered who I was. There was a very dark night of the soul. I know how caregivers feel about this. Every, all my expectations in life, all of our plans, everything I thought I was about, everything I thought life was about, everything I thought God was about, shattered by this one little beautiful baby. And yet it was such a purposeful shattering that has put us on a journey. It's what we, it's what the heart of the caregiver is all about is how to let this experience, not just be something to be overcome, to cope with, how to let it completely change your life. So you, you mentioned that you were raised in a church environment, but it wasn't until you encountered um, an unexplained part of his creation. Uh, no, answers. no answers. Lots of, lots of questions. Right. Okay? Uh, doctors want to tell you the whys. You don't want to know the whys. You don't want to know what caused this or... Uh, you want to know what what you know what 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 do I do as a parent? How do I how do I take care of her? How do I nurture her? How do I how do I give her the best quality of life that is available to her through the love that I have for her? And is this kind of a, a glimpse if you sit back and take a look at it? as of how we might appear to God in our imperfections and in all of our foibles and, and our unique attributes and our, our abuse of his gifts and all, that, that yet he still loves us and he still nurtures and he still has yeah. a plan and a future and a design for our lives even though we are fallen, even though we are, you know, but sinners. Uh, right. Because, you know, that's what seems to happen. And, you know, I've been teaching this course for 10 years and we we work with caregivers of all kinds, whether it's a child with special needs, a spouse with cancer, a teenager with mental illness, a parent with age related issues, whatever. But the patterns of caregiving seem to be the same. When you find out you're going to be the primary caregiver for someone with exceptional needs, that your life is going to have to change even though you're not the one with a disease or disability, that you're going to have to sacrifice and give up. Um, there's that whole sense of um, you're starting this journey out in fear because you're probably with the person when they get their diagnosis probably. And you're told all this terrifying stuff. You immediately go to the internet and start Googling and decide, I'm not going to, this isn't going to be our story. We're going to defeat this. So you do all this research and you get more and more horrified the more you read. Um, and you begin to realize this is way over your head. And then the world starts saying to you, God never gives people like your daughter to other people unless they're very special. You and your husband, Wynn, must be very special. And at that, you want to kick him in the kneecaps and say, are you kidding me? This is absolutely ruining our finances, ruining our marriage, ruining me emotionally, ruining me spiritually. I'm not special. I'm a disaster. I'm falling apart. I mean, in this, you know, but you put on a brave face because the whole world's trying to be kind, saying, you must be special. Well, yes, you are special. You've been chosen for God to walk you through this, but it's going to take a real dark night of the soul to let go of what you thought it was all about to leaning into what it really is about. And that is the heart of this message is it's a heart work. It's an inner healing that the Lord does through helping you become a servant. And that's, you know, I got to say, this is another big thing that's been on my heart through the teaching of this and, and my and my, my, my students say it all the time. This isn't just for caregivers. The church needs to remember this. We were created to be his for his purposes. And we were created to love and serve one another. And we could, we are good at serving people in different socioeconomic status. We're good at serving people in different countries. We're good at serving people that have a different skin color, but we have a very hard time serving the people we rub elbows with every day. And um, it takes this whole heart transformation of, of just like Jesus, stepping down from glory, emptying yourself, and wading right into suffering um, 
after you've done your own self-care. That's, that's the essential essence of this is you need to remember who you are and whose you are and why you're here and the power that is available to you to be able to step in and love and serve your family members, your neighbors, your church workers, your co-workers. Um, and, 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 and it's getting people back into that servant's heart that this is all about. You know, everything you're saying, I completely agree with, and it's certainly a part of the message, but I want to go back to the mess, not the message. Yeah. I want to go back to uh, the reality, because yeah. this is where so many people are. They're in this place where they wake up every day and they don't have the hope. They, they, I read the posts. There's people who have a child with a disability and every day the post is, yeah. well, I thought we were going to make it through the night without an episode, but, and now we're on our way, but, and now it's happened again, but, and now they're, they're talking about cutting off my electric, electricity, but, and, and so uh, they're still in that mess. Yeah. They haven't yet gotten a hold of the message. And so what I want from you different than what I, from Peter, or different from other, others in the caregiving space, is I want to spend a little bit more time in the mess with you, because it, it, you are elevated to a position, when you, when you say anchor woman, right, those of us in media know this is not, this is not the lowly position, this is the edified position, this is the position that, that um, p people cater to, this is the position that, that the p people want to keep happy uh, and and uh, uh, this side of the camera, they, they want to pay a little bit more attention to than on the production side and on the floor right. side. Uh, so you're feeling pretty good. You're looking good. You're, you've got a career. Your husband's doing good. It's looking good. He's got a career. He's tooling around his little private plane. And, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, things come crashing down and you're in a place of despair, darkness, misunderstanding, uh, not even grasping, words being thrown at you uh, that end in exia and plasia and, and, yeah. and morphia. And, and all of a sudden you're having to become a, a lexicon of medical terminology and the doctors are doctors. Okay, as far as their sympathetic oath, uh, as opposed to the Hippocratic oath, uh, their message delivers. They got to deliver bad news. They some some do it well. Others use the technical terms and then leave you swimming in a pool of of uh, of um, acronyms and and uh, dire the most dire diagnosis because yeah. if they give you a word of encouragement and then something happens, well, uh, there's malpractice and there's, you know, but you said and you told me. So they're so cautious. So here you are left on your own. And you've got a family and you tell your family that this is going on and, they, and they, they're compassionate, they're sympathetic and we're so sorry. But, but it's like the death of a, of a loved one. There are no words that a stranger or even a close person can offer to you that are going to change the circumstance. Correct. None. No one. No one. We can lay hands on that precious child. We can pray for every demon to be delivered. We can pray for every healing and miracle to take place. And when it doesn't, then we've poured out our entire toolbox of every tool available to us. We've changed from frankincense oil to uh, spike nard. We've, we, we've, we've now come up with uh, an essential oil. We're, uh, we're now doing something on the bottom of her feet because we read that the, there's, we, we've considered uh, acupuncture, acupressure. Uh, 27 years of trying. Uh, right, everything and nothing is changing, okay? It's not getting better. Okay, so you had a turning point. You had, and, and I don't want to call it a breaking point. I want, I, to call it, I want to call it a breakthrough point. Because mm -hmm. in order to, you know, most people consider a breaking point is, is God, it just 
snaps us in two. But a breakthrough point is when God tears it down and begins the building process simultaneously so that you are not in this pit of despair and hopelessness, but yet you see the light of one, and he only gives you the light of one candle, just to let you know that all the darkness in the world can't extinguish the light of just that one candle. So there's that one little candle, and the way your eyes focus, you go into a dark room, you find that little green light that's on the smoke detector, Okay, that's what, that's what your eye is going to follow, find, and that's what you be, and this is for you. So you're, you're at that break, it's a break point, but it's also a breakthrough point. Okay? Right. What happened? I was in the nursery. It was about two o'clock in the morning. I was holding her, and at the time she was having about 500 seizures a day, and they had sent her home to pretty much die in our arms, you know. And I'm just sobbing and holding this seizing baby. My tears are streaming down on this baby. And I had come to the point, exactly as you described, where here I'd been this very powerful person. And I had realized that all my worldly power could do nothing for this situation. That I was completely powerless and there was nothing anyone could do. And for the first time in my life, I cried out to the Lord and I said, how did Mary the mother of Jesus, watch her suffer, her child suffer and die like I'm watching my child suffer and die. And I heard him speak to my heart, let her suffering be for my glory. I went face down. I'd been struck by lightning. And I raced to my bedroom to dig up a Bible somewhere and open it. And I just happened. It was just miraculous. I'm just sobbing, flipping through the Bible, and I'm suddenly reading about a God who stepped down from glory into suffering on purpose. I was reading about a God who said the first will be last and the last will be first, and that I used the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And I was just reading all these things where they were the completely opposite of the way the world worked. And suddenly I was just pumped full of this supernatural hope that I, I was set on fire. I, I couldn't get enough of his word. I, it was just incredible. It was a total transformation. And that's where this all began of, and that's why my passion is so strong to get caregivers reconnected, even in this mess where you have a hard time leaving the hospital, where you have a hard time making it to a small group, where you have a hard time reading a book without wanting to cry, getting them reconnected to God's word. That's what changed everything. It was getting back into his word and hearing him speak to our personal situation through his word. It's just essential. It's the role of the church and it's the only thing. It's the only form of self-care that is really going to change things is getting people back in his word. Because, you know, as caregivers, you tend to get real disconnected. You tend to be so absorbed with the drama of the disease or disability, with the drama of the Alzheimer's and the people yelling at you and family relationships falling apart and none of your friends wanting or knowing what to do or say with you and you're starting to feel isolated and alone. And the more you feel isolated and alone, the more depressed you get and the more depressed you get, the more prickly you get. And nobody wants to be around you because that's all you can talk about. And so it's this world of people out there who are, they're not coming to church anymore. You know, they're not making it to small group anymore. They're not spending time with friends anymore who can get them back into God's word. They're, they're angry at God for this pain they're experiencing and for, and for God allowing this to happen to their child or to their husband, you know? And so there's this huge disconnect to the very thing. No, the only thing that can really, really change all of this mess is, is that's the role of the church is to get people back into his word and into his presence. It, it changes everything. And yet here's Mary Addison, 27 years later, still having medical issues, but your circumstances haven't changed, but your feelings, your understanding, your, 
Uh, listening to the words of Jesus when they asked him, when they saw the blind man, now, Rabbi, who sinned, uh, the, the blind man or his parents? And he said, neither. It was done right. so that God might be glorified. Yes. And you say, well, how could God possibly be glorified in a man's blindness, in his yeah. infirmity? And in a so, baby's suffering when we begin to realize that uh, we serve the God who did suffer, who came down, who walked to feel our pain and then to bear our iniquity, yeah. to be beaten, to be scourged, to be uh, denied, to be crucified, uh, mm -hmm. to lay down his life for us so that we could have life. Now, you would say, but he said you could have life to have life more abundantly. And yet here 27 years later, is your life more abundant? Well, if all I use is one measuring stick, then the answer is no. If I use man's yardstick, my answer is no. Okay? There has been no cure. There has been no uh, resolution. Uh, we're praying through it for breakthrough and hoping that one day that will come. But if it doesn't come, then in the meantime, what are you supposed to do? And that's exactly what the heart of the caregiver is all about. Uh, study to move you from overwhelmed to overjoyed. For you as a caregiver who are facing what you think is an insurmountable challenge in your life is actually the exact kind of challenge that God says that I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, I will redeem you with my outstretched right hand, that God will send you the errands and the hers to lift up your weary arms, as he did for Moses, so the victory would belong to God if you would just look through his lens and not your own. Yes. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to dig into the message of you are loved, you are chosen, you are equipped, that God is still sovereign even in these seasons of caregiving. And the course of life, the course of death, and the message of hope that God imparts to all of us through the shed blood of the Messiah. We'll be right back. Not everything that makes the headlines has biblical importance, but many events that happen around the world do, and you never hear about them. Igniting a Nation is pleased to teach Revealing Prophecy every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the Marriott 280 in Birmingham. We will cover worldwide events and insider information that will connect the dots of what's happening around the world with biblical prophecy. If you happen to miss a class, we'll televise each week's class at 10 o'clock Central Time on ignitinganation.com and all our social media outlets. Copies of the teachings will also be available to purchase on our website at www.ignitinganation.com. The Lord meets you right where you are and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed, simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color. 
and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Mary Tudoro, author of The Heart of the Caregiver, From Overwhelmed to Overjoyed, a Bible study like none other to take you from hopelessness to understanding who God is, how God works, and how He can and will work in your life if you let Him. Mary, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Mary, the study is birthed out of uh, your journey, what you found out through the realities of caregiving that not only identified your need, but the more global need of the caregiving community, that there is a clarion call for help. There is a, a need. And uh, fortunately, this new legislation is passed. Uh, there's new focus on caregiving, but the church, uh, the seminaries or the pastoral care community uh, doesn't really know much about how to, and I call it kind of uh, how to spot uh, for the caregiver. Uh, you know, you, you stand around a trampoline and you spot. You, you go to gymnastics and you find spotters. And, and you go to the gym and there's somebody spotting you as you're lifting weights. But who's spotting uh, for the caregiver? Who's looking out to make sure that you're, you uh, make a weekly call, just a check-in call? What's going on? How are you doing? Um, can I... Can I can two of us come over and one of us stay while I take you out and get you out of the house for a little bit? Uh, even if it's just to take you to go cry somewhere, to just hear um, what you're going through, to, uh, you know, you, 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 in, your, in your time, which is not your time, uh, you may get caught up in flipping to Pinterest or to... Uh, some of the other uh, social media sites and you look at these wonderful pictures and you have to shut them down because you're not going to be able to post uh, that picture on the family vacation uh, where everybody's doing well. Um, you know, how, how do you navigate that? And when you put the study together, how did you articulate your experience and weave it into this message of God? Well, the heart of the caregiver really has, it never mentions our family or me. Some of the, some of the video lessons do, but the actual study guide doesn't because 
what became so clear to me through the years of laying on hospital floors and uh, being alone, you know, for months at a time in a hospital with my daughter, with my husband on a whole nother coast in a whole nother city, you know, was that nobody needed anything I had to say. What, what the other hurting people around me that were also sleeping on the floor in the waiting rooms and, in, you know, the hospital NICUs and PICUs and, and in all the doctor's appointments for my mother-in-law through her cancer and dementia, what the other people needed, I could just see it because what was happening to me was they needed to have their hand put in the hand of Jesus. They needed to know that there was a living, loving presence that was available to them all the time that could comfort and transform uh, on a miraculous level. And I, uh, I didn't need to articulate my words. What I, what I felt that I was being called to do was to put his message together in such a way that it communicated clearly to the heart of someone that was finding themselves having to lay down their life for someone else. And, uh, and to remind them that there is no greater love than that. There is, that is a high calling. It's the very calling of Jesus to help them to see through all the principles in God's word being put together, speaking directly to their heart and their pain and what was going on in their life. I, I hope I'm answering that clearly, but it, it really wasn't anything about our journey. It was about how God was speaking to me as a caregiver. I wanted to reiterate those words of comfort to other caregivers. You know, caregiving has so many different aspects to it. There's the physical aspect of the, just the caregiving, the physical strength, the time, the, um, you're, you're on, you're, it's a ringing bell. It's a clanging gong. It's a, it's a, a siren, uh, many, many times. And, uh, having to be prepared for any eventuality. Uh, there's also the financial and navigating what resources are out there that uh, can be made available to the caregiver. There's the insurance, uh, fighting with them for this procedure or that procedure and getting all that. It can be a very, very weary battle, uh, and become battle weary just fighting the battle of yeah. having a child with needs. Uh, have you found that because of your spiritual groundedness, your complete surrender to the will of the Father, that you find that the navigating part of it has become less stressful for you, that you can cast your cares onto Him? I, I'm not saying that you don't have moments where you are about to flip out uh, <laughs> and, and that, that uh, one more thing happens between uh, a, a wheel falling off a chair, uh, uh, something breaking, uh, something being non-responsive. We even talked about your, um, uh, to appear on a, a radio show and your daughter has a seizure and you have to 100% focus on that. Uh, and schedules, you know, uh, interesting, uh, P Peter just moved to Montana. So he's due to be on the program. Monday is his regular slot, the last Monday of the month. And uh, I said, are you settled in Montana? Because he moved from Nashville to Montana. Uh, you know, do you want to talk about uh, a cross country travel, a piano move, and the stories about how a caregiver can navigate a cross country move uh, and a cross country trip with a double amputee wife and what you two did and how you dealt with some of the challenges of it? This is to think that you could go on a cross country trip with somebody who was a double amputee. Uh, that has chronic pain issues, uh, all these things, uh, is, is like this incredible message of hope that says, you mean I could actually do that? I could get out and make a trip like that? You know, I thought I was imprisoned. Uh, this is how, how God works and when you step out in faith. 
And so there's so many aspects. You focused on the spiritual aspect. I know you have a second uh, study in the works that will be released later this year. Uh, as you look at this heart of the caregiver, this, this first study from overwhelmed to overjoyed, migrating into the next study, what, what do you see ch have, having changed in this period of growth for you? Mm. Well, it's a heart change. And from the heart change comes a mindset change. It really is that whole renew your mind. I mean, I'm sure that's what Peter relies on in getting Gracie across country. It's the same thing with me. We've had to plan Mary's funeral three times. We've had to prepare to let her go three times. And what I thought was the most agonizing, horrific, horrible thing in the world has turned out to be a pathway to freedom of when you have learned to lay down everything and totally surrender to the Lord. Um, it, it's that change from, I got this, I got to work this, I got a plan, you know, um, to how are we going to do this, Father? What would you have me do? You know, even, even in uh, preparing my daughter's funeral, what are you teaching us? Um, where is your goodness? You know, uh, learning to just complete. And when that shift begins to take place, it's so hard at first because it seems so unrealistic, you know, and that's what we work on in the heart of the caregiver. In the beginning, it's this whole idea of realizing um, what's happening to you isn't that the disease or disability is what's wrecking your life. It's what you think about it that's wrecking your life. You know, that's that that's that first shift in the heart of the caregiver. And then the peaceful caregiver, which is the second book, has been my journey into taking that mindset shift, that renewed mind, that new perspective of instead of thinking about it as this is something terrible to this is a trial to be overcome with God. And not only is it happening to me, but it if I allow him to work through me, it can have profound effects on everyone around me. I mean, our relation, our marriage is better. My relationship with our other adult son, our relationships are better. My friendships are better. Ministry is better because I got out of self, as Jesus teaches us, and this is the focus of the peaceful caregiver, is getting out of self and allowing the Holy Spirit to run your life. And that whole dying to self, and that's what so many people are struggling with, is in the very beginning of the heart of the caregiver, we go through a whole series of exercises of uh, what's your pain and recognizing what your pain and your hard feelings are. And then people come to this aha moment that it didn't just start when this person with challenges came into my life. These are unfinished business that I've been dealing with for a long time and other people's suffering are just triggering my own suffering, you know? And, and that's where people start saying, wow, everybody needs to do this study because that's true for everyone. You know, when someone else is hurting and, and lashes out, we tend to get offended. And then you make the hurt go further. You know, it's, it's just a whole big process. But back to your point, the heart of the caregiver is really about making that mental shift from uh, uh, how you perceive what's going on. Then the peaceful caregiver is now that you've made that shift, how do you really learn to die to self and live through the power of the Holy Spirit? Is it fair to put any expectation on family members and friends to travel this road with you? Uh, uh, let me, if I may, a little bit reframe that. Yes, I, I believe we're in relationship with other people because we're all here for each other. No man is an island and we are all meant to be here for each other. But when you haven't done the inner work of realizing who you are, whose you are, why you're here, that you are a part of a greater whole, a part of a greater plan. Sometimes it's really hard for people to help you. <laughs> and you're your own worst enemy. And even though you can expect people to help you, you can't expect people to take on your pain and the pain of the person you're, you're caring for. 
So until you learn how to love and serve with grace and mercy, I mean, this is a whole chapter in the heart of the caregiver, and you can, and then you can allow other people to help you in their own imperfection, you know, um, and you can extend grace and mercy to the people that are trying to help you in their own flawed ways. It's a bomb. <laughs> it, it, if you haven't, you know, pursued, that's why it's all about you doing, you're the only person in the situation you can change. You can't change your husband with Alzheimer's. You can't change your aunt who's grumpy. You know, you can't make your siblings in Ohio come help you in South Carolina. You know, you have to do the work first. And, oh gosh, I hear testimony about this all the time. Once you become a person of um, where your heart is right and the Lord is working through you, now when people start working with you, He's changing people through you. And it becomes this ministry of love. It becomes a sign of hope to a hurting world. I, I have a dear friend whose daughter's been in a wheelchair all of her life. My, my Mary Addison is in and out of a wheelchair sometimes. But whenever they go to a restaurant, they always take their adult daughter with them in the wheelchair. And it's a very, very difficult scene to behold. They rarely leave a restaurant without somebody paying their bill and leaving them a note saying, you have totally blessed me. I've seen a new level of love and service. Thank you. So when you're doing this caregiving right and full of the power of the Holy Spirit from a place of love instead of from fear, you actually have a ministry. And people want to be around you. They want to know, what is this? What is this? And it, it can shift. And it does shift for so many of the people that do this work and let it let God's word have its effect on you. It 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 really changes everything. Are you finding the churches are becoming more open to support groups, more open to meetings? I'm looking at a report in the religious news about a church. Southeastern Christian Church started a uh, Alzheimer caregiver support group on campus, meets once a month, and it's growing, uh, and they're finding that people are connecting and supporting each other and helping each other, even though they're dealing with an Alzheimer's patient in their own homes, they're finding a way to support each other. And there's others who are now coming who are sitting in saying, you know, we, we want to know about this. We want to join the support group, not because we have anybody in our life with Alzheimer's, but because we want to be a part of supporting you and becoming more aware of what we can do uh, in helping you and what, what are your needs. Uh, is that part, uh, do you feel that the church needs to bump it up a notch, that the church needs to become more engaged and proactive in the community, working alongside of organizations. Uh, you know, there's, there has not been a great cooperative effort between uh, the National Heart Association and the church, or the American Cancer Society and the church, or even maybe in the case of the American Alzheimer's Association and the church. Uh, have we created barriers that uh, these are people who are in charities and they're in this space of putting out uh, guidelines and documents and references and resources and then over here you have the church which is the uh, biblical point of view and they're their own separate community. Uh, should it be that all are working together and maybe somebody's advocating for a little bit more of a cooperative effort that maybe in these church groups they bring in the representative from the Alzheimer's Association to come up with some fresh new ideas. Are the pastors uh, in their uh, conferences, are they hearing about the growing need of caregivers uh, that the isolation, the separation, this is a desperate need. You're planning on building houses in Costa Rica or Guatemala or uh, whatever outside the country, but yet next door you have a neighbor you don't know. I have a next door neighbor with a special needs child. They have a special needs van. 
whenever I see her, I come over and spend time with her. They know that I'm right next door, and if they needed anything whatsoever, that I'm just a door knock away. They don't want. It's not their desire. Uh, they get up and go to church every Sunday morning. They pack their daughter in her, her special needs chair. Uh, she's now five years past what the doctors told her she could even possibly live. And uh, she is just such a sweet, precious delight. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the prognosis is not that she's going to be in her 30s, 40s, and 50s. The prognosis is, is that every day is a step closer to a, 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 a fine-pointed end. But in the meantime, uh, it's the community and the love. And it's, these are the relevant issues. Uh, LGBT is getting all the press and there are uh, the statistics given to me by what was sent by um, uh, your media outlet was 40 million but I have 65 million uh, is the statistic that, that I currently have 65 million Americans are faced with some level of caregiving uh, right. some in full-time caregiving some in partial caregiving this seems to be a much broader issue than uh, LGBT rights and uh, the voice for this and the voice for that. 65 million is 20% of the American population. Yeah, and it's growing. So this is something that we need to get a grip on in two camps, the spiritual camp, which is finding the sovereignty and the strength of God through Bible studies like the heart of the caregiver and becoming a little bit more activistic in the starting with the church, getting the church to identify within the church population uh, survey, uh, find out, uh, ask people, uh, people you don't see, people who live in your neighborhood that don't come out on Sunday morning Maybe there's a reason they don't come out on Sunday morning. It's because they have a child and they don't want to take that child because they don't want the child to be disruptive. Right. And they're more concerned about the uh, cause and effect. Um, when I was in the pulpit, I said, bring the kids. Okay. If you can't get used to a baby crying or a kid having a tantrum, uh, and this is such sacred ground that that violates all tenets, of the belief system, then we aren't the family that we say we are if we're not going to let family actions take place. Well, you know, I want to say this. The church is the answer. The church is the answer. Is the church prepared to meet the call? No. Is the church aware of the call? No. I mean, I travel and speak at churches a lot, and it's the pastors who are just going, wow. <laughs> now, the other piece of that is that because this whole caregiving thing, yes, it's a very complicated issue politically and logistically and all those kind of things. Right. But it's not that complicated because it's, um, I'm trying to put my arms around everything you just said in, and make this as simple as possible. Well, we actually have 15 seconds. <laughs> it's about changing hearts. And it's, it's not about Alzheimer's and autism and cancer and mental illness and all that. It's about getting Jesus back into the heart of the person who's going to be doing the serving and caring. And from there, that person being empowered to spread love instead of fear. And when the church realizes that that's their job is to put people's hands back in the hands of Jesus and they start doing it, that's when the grassroots movement of this is going to run like wildfire throughout the church. Words of Wisdom by Mary Tudoro, author of The Bible Study, The Heart of the Caregiver, From Overwhelmed to Overjoyed, and look for an October release. And we'll have her back here uh, to talk about the October release in October on the new study and uh, continue in this narrative on caregiving. We're going to take a short break, uh, and when we return, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. Mary Tudoro, thank you. Thank you You're for welcome. sharing this story. Thank you. We'll be right back.